So uh, Les was full of stories like that, and I got to know him for the rest of his life, and uh, really a genius inventor and guitarist, and there's just simply not going to be someone else like him again. Um, as I said, I first heard guitar with Les Paul, but I didn't start playing then uh, at age six. At age 10, I started playing, but I played drums. I jumped into the uh, junior high school band. I wanted to march around at parades and football games, and so I was in the Ludlow Marching Panthers. Woo! And we, I loved it. I had such a great time. Sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. And then that summer, the Beatles came out that year. Everything in music just exploded and changed enormously. My whole life changed. I knew for a fact finally what I wanted to do. I definitely wanted to be a recording artist. I wanted to have chicks all over me and sleep in a bed full of money. <laughs> At least I got the recording artist part. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, so it, uh, after the eighth grade, I moved over the summer to a new place. It was only 10 miles away, Florence, Kentucky, but suddenly I didn't know anybody. I decided not to get in the school band, instead to, to get in my first rock band. I got my first little rock band. We were really good. We played uh, all, the, all the current Beatle music and all the, the Stones and the Kinks and everything that came in those first really few brilliant years that were there. And we were called the Denims because we wore uh, blue jean jackets and matching blue jean pants, you know, the Canadian tuxedo. And, <laughs> <coughs> and I was very, very happy being uh, the drummer, singer. I was a singing drummer. That was kind of interesting. I loved it very much, and a couple years went by, and we were just doing great, and all of a sudden, in my junior year of high school, I got uh, mononucleosis, the kissing disease. I'll tell you what, I think I must have kissed a, a water fountain, because I certainly wasn't kissing anybody else. I was uh, too busy playing every weekend. But anyway, I got the kissing disease, and they said, now you have to stay at home and be completely inactive. You have to sit still. You cannot play the drums. You just sit on, lay on your bed all day for two months. Oh, gee. So I had, a, I had these songs in my head. I could hear them, but I couldn't play them. I couldn't explain them. I couldn't show them to anyone at all. So I thought, you know, I'm going to teach myself how to play a guitar. I borrowed an acoustic guitar from one of the denims, and this is how I did it. Totally self-taught, I'd hear what I wanted the note to be, and I'd find that note on the string, put that finger there. Here's, here's what's the harmony? Okay, it's that. Okay, then that finger has to be, where's that note? There, okay, now I need another harmony. What's that one? There, <coughs> okay. So, you know, that's how I taught myself to play. And uh, after those two months, I went back to the Denims and I showed them my first five songs and I said, what the heck chords are those? I said, oh yeah, uh, I guess that's a G demolished right there. And <laughs> this one over here is A furnished flat. I'm pretty sure about that. I never really have learned the, the chord names and stuff. I don't worry about that stuff, so. Uh, what followed after that was years and years and years of struggling through uh, a lot of different bands that never went anywhere and nothing happened. Always the perennial promise of success. I was plummeting to success like nobody's business. <laughs> when I got in a band in Nashville, it was a good band. We wore uh, authentic 1940s vintage clothing, fedora hats, tie pins, everything, and you had to wear them every day, all day. Even if you just went over to Kroger's, you had to be dressed up like a gangster. So it, gave, it got us a lot of attention. It was a lot of fun to do, in, in fact. Uh, one night we were playing in a dark, dank um, motorcycle bar called Fanny's. <laughs> and I could see the entranceway and I saw this strange group of people come in. Immediately knew, that's Frank Zappa, there's no question about that. Uh, they, they filed in and they sat down and listened to us for about 40 minutes and we were a good band. We played Stevie Wonder songs and and, uh, you know, Steely Dan and some good music. Uh, I was playing Gimme Shelter when Frank came up to the edge of the stage and shook my hand and said, the chauffeur knows you, I'm going to give him, I'm going to get your number from him and I, I'll audition you when I get back from tour. Great. Woo. Wow. <laughs> Six months went by, I never heard a, a word from Frank. Uh, the band broke up, I was three months behind in my rent and just about ready to Consider, well, I'm 27 years old. I guess I missed the boat. I mean, all the Beatles made it when they were 21, so I guess I'm out of here. And then one day I got a call from Frank. And uh, he gave me a list of things to learn quickly in one week. I borrowed the records because I was dirt poor. And for the first time in my life, got on a plane and flew out to California and did the audition for Frank Zappa. 
and out of 50 guitar players, I, I won the audition. So, thank you. <clears throat> now that dramatically changed my life, of course. I had never even played in anything but 4-4, so it opened tons of doors, and I could speak for another three hours about all the stuff I learned simply in that one year with Frank Zappa, but I'll just move my career along here. What happened is we played a two-month tour of, of the United States, and we had two weeks off, and then we were going to do a two-month tour of Europe. Well, my guitar never arrived back. Lost in transit, somebody stole it, I don't know. So I had to run out and try to quickly find a Stratocaster, and the only one I could find was this cheap, old, ugly, tobacco brown sunburst guitar. It was horrid looking, but it only cost $285, so I thought, well, okay. But I didn't know what to do, so the next day I went to my friend Seymour Duncan. I went to his house. He's a, a famous pick pickup maker now. He's, he's one of the fa most famous in the world. But I said, Seymour, what are we going to do? This guitar is so ugly. What am I going to do? He said, I, oh, I know what to do. I know, we'll vintage it. Well, what's that mean? <laughs> Come on outside. We went out in his front yard, and he got in his car and grabbed some tools and things, opened up the hood of his car. He laid the guitar in the grass, took out some lighter fluid, and lit it. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Look like Bonanza, you know. <laughs> so, okay, well, I guess uh, we're, we're on to something here. And uh, he took sandpaper and rubbed it all over it, got some grease off the engine, put it on the neck, was doing all this funny stuff with it, and uh, he was dragging it around the yard and the grass like this, and then he got out, we got out the screwdrivers and things that he had, and we're gouging the guitar, and... And we look up, and his next-door neighbor has been standing there. A woman's been standing there watching us the whole time. Okay. So next day, I took it into Frank's rehearsal, and he said, You wanted to ruin your guitar, Adrian. Why didn't you just loan it to a friend? <laughs> From there, uh, we went to Europe. And uh, when we were playing in Germany, in Cologne, Unbeknownst to me, Brian Eno was in the audience. He knew that David Bowie was looking for a new guitar player for his upcoming tour. He called David Bowie and said, tomorrow night they're playing where you are in Berlin. You better come to the show and see this guy. So the next night in Berlin, I'm playing with Frank Zappa, and uh, there was a portion of the show where Frank would take an extended guitar solo with just the bass player and the drummer. Everyone else leave the stage. So I left, and as I did, I looked over here at the monitor board, and I saw... Oh my God, there's David Bowie and Iggy Pop standing there. Whew. So I thought, well, you know, I've played a lot of David's music. I'm just going to go over and say thank you. So I walked over and I said, David, I, I love your music. I just want to say thank you. He said, great, how'd you like to be in my band? <laughs> well, I, I'm kind of playing with that guy out there right now. <laughs> he said, yeah, but your, your tour ends on this date and mine starts two weeks later. And Let's talk about it after your show. So I jumped into David Bowie's band. And before I knew it, I was doing another world tour. We went this time to Japan. We went to Australia. In Japan, they showed, they showed our perf live performance to a quarter of the population. 24 million people watched me play guitar the first time I ever stepped on a stage in Japan, which was pretty cool. Instant success, you see. Uh, we played in Madison Square Gardens. That's one of the most memorable dates I, re I remember. Um, first of all, Madison Square Gardens is not square, and there are, are no gardens. So there we are playing at Madison Square Gardens. When you play there, it's pretty amazing because the, the first this many rows, like you guys, it's, it's all famous people. You look down there, there's Mick Jagger and Bianca. There's, there's you know, Andy Warhol and his thing, his bunch. I looked over one time I was playing, and I looked, and I was staring right at Dustin Hoffman, and he was staring right back at me. <laughs> oh, wow, this is really something, you know? It was a crazy scene anyway, because it just nutty things go on there. At that point, I had just started making animal sounds with my guitar. And during the sound check, I was trying to make some elephant sounds. And I, all of a sudden, I heard real elephants. <laughs> Looked around behind me, and there were four elephants. It turned out that the Ringling Brothers Circus was down in the bowels of the Madison Square Gardens. They brought them up four at a time and fed them and washed them. And they responded to my guitar. I was really pretty happy about that. Then we went backstage, and they had this big, beautiful banquet set out, long tables of food and all kinds of stuff for the band. It was a seven-piece band, and some of the guys from England had brought some of their kids. So there were kids there. There were wives. There were, 
you know, a mass of people hanging around this banquet room, and we're just having a nice time talking, all of a sudden the door kicks open, and a chimpanzee in an orange houndstooth suit on roller skates rides into the room, and he starts chasing the kids, and they're going all over, and they're throwing food, and it's just, holy mackerel, what happened here? And then his manager came in. And we knew it was his manager because he had on the same orange houndstooth suit. So Madison Square Gardens was one of my highlights. Um, that night, Talking Heads were there. And they were, at the time, a real hot band, coming up and coming. And uh, I'll get back to that later, in just a moment. But what happened in between there, one night David Bowie and I went to the, the Bottom Line Club in New York to see... Uh, the composer Steve Reich uh, play one of his new pieces. When the lights came up, uh, David said, oh, over there at that table, there's Robert Fripp. Well, I knew King Crimson music really well. Second favorite band in the world for me, second only to the Beatles, was King Crimson. But I didn't even know what Robert Fripp looked like. So I said, okay, great, I gotta go say hi to him. I walked over and, hey, Robert, I'm, I'm playing with David now. I said, oh, well, so, well, here, let me write. He pulled a Sharpie out of his bag. Here, let me write my number on your arm. <laughs> oh. That's going to take months to get off, <laughs> but okay. So I called Robert, and uh, we had coffee and conversation a couple of times, and that started the ball rolling towards our friendship. We've now been making music together on and off for more than 30 years, so it worked out pretty well, even though he's the oddest of characters. <laughs> <coughs> and I'm perfect. <laughs> um, anyway, we got back from the uh, David Bowie tour and sat around for a while. What do I do next? Gee. Dots were connecting pretty quick there. Phone rang, talking heads. Hey, we want you to come to New York. We just, we just want, to, want you to rehearse with us for four days, and then we're going to play a festival for 70,000 people in Canada. Whew. Okay, we rehearsed four days and flew up in helicopters to land backstage, seeing 70,000 people under us. Kind of scary, especially since we'd only rehearsed four days. The second show we did was in Central Park, only... Only 125,000 people showed up for that one. It was a bit of a disappointment. But. So then I toured the world with Talking Heads. So the year before, I'd been in, the world, in Japan with uh, David Bowie. Next year, I was there with Talking Heads. The next year, I was there with King Crimson, because what happened after Talking Heads went to Europe, the first day we arrived in London, Robert Fripp called me and said, I'm starting a band with Bill Bruford, and we'd love for you to be in it. And I said, gee, Bill Bruford, my favorite drummer, Robert Fripp, OK. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, so when the Talking Heads were finished, I did a record with their bass player and drummer, Chris and Tina. That was called the Tom Tom Club. We had a giant hit that I co-wrote called uh, Genius of Love. It was the big summer hit. So that year, in 1981, I also put out my first solo record called Lone Rhino. So I put out the first dis uh, Crimson record, Discipline, the first solo record, Lone Rhino, and the Tom Tom Club, which had a major hit. So pretty good bumper crop year that year, 1981. And that is kind of the short of my history. There you go. That's as much as I want to say, because everything that happened from there uh, is just so, so much to enumerate. Uh, I've just had the most fabulous ride, uh, including people like Nine Inch Nails and uh, Paul Simon and people like that. I will tell you Paul Simon's story, though, because that was fun, too. Uh, Paul Simon, Laurie Anderson told him, there's this guy, he doesn't really play guitar. He makes sounds with it. Uh, <laughs> So he uses a guitar synthesizer or something. So Paul said, okay, I'd like to have him on my new record. He was making a new record that was going to be called Graceland. And uh, I went to New York to play with him. I arrived a little early. It was just the engineer and producer, Roy Haley, a guy who had been producing him for years and years, and me. And he put up some of the tracks and started playing them. Well, they were all African music. They were all African players. That I was the first white person to, to walk in and play on this record. So I thought, oh, poor Roy, poor Roy Haley, he's having a senior moment here. He's a, put up the wrong damn tape. <laughs> you know, this is not Paul Simon music. So um, Paul Simon arrived, and I told him my concern. And he said, well, here, I don't have all the words written, but uh, I'll show you some of this stuff here. I'll sing, we'll put up Boy in the Bubble. He, they'd put up Boy in the Bubble, just with the music, no vocals. He'd stand right here in my ear and sing it, like whisper. It was chilling, you know? And then it sounded like Paul Simon. Then I got it, and then I knew what to do on that record. And, and uh, Paul was one of the only people who uh, actually 
told me exactly what to play. Almost no one ever does that with me. They just turn me loose and want me to, to do wild things. But he had exactly what he wanted. We found this one sound once that sounds like a horn section. And, oh, we've got to put this in. Here's what you play. da 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 Okay, I can play that. No, not a lot of people know that. They all think it's a horn section. It's not. It's me. Just by myself with a guitar synth. I hear that song. I hear that song all over the world, and I just kind of sit there going, ooh, wow, that's nice. Uh, 